Now, from the title of this video, you're likely to feel some kind of way. One group of people will be angry that I said Korean MMORPGs suck because they, in fact, like Korean MMOs. And another group will be like, yeah, brother, preach. Korean MMOs do suck. Now, this video isn't just going to be about me hating on them because, in all honesty, I like Korean MMOs, always have done and likely always will. They're different as an experience from our own Western games and even different from other countries in the East, like China and Japan. They're all very unique, but for the purpose of this video, I'll just be going over why I think Korean MMORPGs will always suck, at least to some extent from my perspective. This video is about the mechanisms that are at play to make Korean MMOs have the issues that many people consider to be deal breakers or at least lessen their enjoyment of the titles. So I would like to ask that you wait until you've watched the video in its entirety before you jump to any conclusions, and then let me know in the comments what you think about this topic. Now the first obvious point, and likely the most talked about one, is going to be the monetization. I think you'll believe me when I say I've had this conversation probably a few thousand times at this stage, and it's a burning hot topic whenever a Korean MMO is being discussed. What about that pay to win? What about that cash shop? Now this in my eyes is an extremely valid conversation to be having. And yes, I entirely wholeheartedly agree that this is the biggest sticking point for Western players actually enjoying these games, or at least on surface level it is. It's also likely the largest contributing factor for the statements some may say in earnest, Korean MMOs suck. This is a problem that I do not think is likely to change, or at least not in the way that you would think or hope that it would change, especially since there's more layers to this than you would think. Now to talk about this would take forever to go through the nuances of different cultures, but just for the sake of brevity, in the West, the commonly accepted sentiment is that translating your wealth into a video game is unfair, and in the East, it's not, or at least to a lesser extent. You'll likely have seen this point being made a bunch of times over the years, and that it's more accepted in the East due to status of wealth. You know, why should you, a wealthy businessman, be unable to compete with someone who sits at home all day playing video games for 12 hours? You're rich, you have more status, and therefore you should be better in the game also. This, I think, does play a part, but I think it's a part that is much lesser than it's given credit for, and the fact that this opinion exists within that culture is not the actual major contributing factor, although it, of course, will play a role. Some of you watching this now will agree with that sentiment of being able to pay more money means you should be better in the game. I've seen it a bunch of times when I've made videos on this topic. You have money, so why should you have to grind and be behind when you can just pay to skip? This is something that if you would have introduced 15 years ago within the culture in the West, it would have been entirely unthinkable, but it is now at least moderately prevalent. There's a reason for this, and we're all part of it. It's taking over, and unless something changes, we'll see the same cultural acceptance of this in a widespread fashion as it is in Korea. So we have to examine, how did Korean gamers get to this stage? Well, how Korean people actually perceive the value of a video game and how businesses exploited this is part of the discussion, and it goes back a long time. In Korean culture, it is extremely common to play games in what is referred to as a PC bong, which is spelled PC bang, but they pronounce that A's very differently to us, which is essentially a real cool PC cafe. It's a social experience that has been gaining in popularity for decades now. The way that this works is anyone can enter, you pay a nominal fee for however many hours you wish to top up on a machine, and then you get to play games on high-end equipment, order food, hang out with your friends. This is extremely common, and you'll find people from all age groups participate in. These establishments are usually open 24 hours a day, and different times of the day will have different demographics. There's many reasons why these are so popular, but a few of the most obvious ones would be the social aspect. They have no one nagging them, you know, a spouse or parents telling them to study, do something more productive having access to high quality equipment without the initial large investment, and of course, the fact that games here are free, and oftentimes with incentives for playing in the PC bong instead of at home. Now, this last point is something that leads into why the pay-to-win culture has been perpetuated by business and why it's so accepted in Korea. Even in the West, we know at this point, which games have the worst monetization? The free ones. Why is this? because there's no guaranteed income from the business from the sale of the game, and therefore they make the money from the users in a different way. Microtransactions. It is accepted at this point that a free-to-play game will have no upward limit on spending, and in Korea, if you look at the top list of popular titles right now, you'll notice that they are all free, 
and all of them rely heavily on microtransactions. You'll be piecing this together at this point of how this is the perfect storm for creating a culture of people being used to free-to-play games. In the East, you had a growing market for decades that was all based on titles that were free-to-play, and then in the West, you had decades of games we would buy for a box price, and then in the MMORPG landscape, likely a subscription each month. And what you have to remember is that gaming in Korea is absolutely huge. Esports has been a thing over there with celebrity status. For decades now, they play in stadiums, they have their own channels that are very widely watched for esports and for games. Gaming in Korea is massive. And the PC bong is essentially a huge part of why this culture exists and why it's so popular. Now, over the years, Korean players have gotten used to this in their games, just as we in the West are now getting used to it as well, as it's more prevalent here. We have more free-to-play games now than ever before, and you'll find an extremely common sentiment in the MMO genre of people refusing to pay for games and only wanting to play free-to-play titles. Remember at the start of this section, I was talking about how this type of monetization and cultural difference wouldn't change, at least not in the way that you'd think. In my opinion, it isn't that Korean games will eventually become less pay-to-win and conform to Western games, but that Western games will become more pay-to-win and eventually it will be the main opinion that this is accepted and the norm, and that is if we're not already there. Now, the design of these games also has to play a factor, and the design of the games has a one-to-one -one direct correlation with the monetization. The respecting of your time as a player when you are free to play is an afterthought, it seems, in a lot of these games. And why should they respect your time? From the company's perspective, you're only indirectly contributing to the game's financial success. You are free advertising, you're a prop in the world for paying players to interact with. And so the game is designed to inconvenience you to the stage you become a paying player, and the systems are put into place from the very beginning to try and get you to that stage. They make the games as time-consuming and grindy as possible, so they can sell you skips, they can sell you speed boosts. The next part might sound crazy, but trust me, this is real. They've used psychologists in many games over the years to figure out how best to get you to spend money in their games, the psychological triggers to spend, to get addicted, not only addicted to playing the game, but to spending in the game as well. That's where loot boxes came from, the flashing lights, the thrill of the gamble, a psychological manipulation that is undoubtedly contributing to growing gambling addiction in the world, specifically in the youth, and it's only just now that some governments are starting to pay attention to this and the actual detriment it's having on society. And let's not forget how MMORPGs have been designed since the beginning of the genre. Go fuck yourself. The status of being the best, showing off those warglaves of Azanoth in town, showing off your PvP prowess, being the top-ranked player in the top guilds, doing the best things, looking the best. These used to be earned from solely achievement, and that's not to say that they aren't partly based on time investment and skill anymore, but there's shortcuts in almost all of the titles from the East, and it's beginning to seep into the West through these exact same design methods used in free-to-play games. Some shortcuts include buying cosmetics, buying power directly, or paying to skip the grind and get to the top as quickly as possible. The design of these free-to-play titles are not compatible with fairness. Games designed in Korea have systems within that cannot be fair, and even if you remove the cash shop skips, the fact that the game is designed from the ground up with these systems in mind means that the game would suffer from a play perspective, as the problems still exist, they're baked into the game, but the method to ease them is removed from the cash shop. To give a clear example of this, take the typical mobile and free-to-play mechanic of stamina. Stamina, or whatever they want to call it in the game, it'll be a very similar system, is a way to gate free-to-play players from progressing in the game using only time contribution. If you have 50 stamina and an activity that gives you progression consumes one stamina, you'll do 50 and then you'll have to wait for the next day to reset. But they will likely sell you ways to regenerate that stamina faster, or outright fill it back up for some form of currency you can buy. Now, if you were to take that game with that stamina system and transport it to the West, removing the paid alleviation, but not changing the core game design from the very foundation, the game would be fundamentally broken and everyone would be having the same poor experience that they force upon the free-to-play players. The game likely wouldn't be very popular due to this, which brings me to my next point and one that yet again is woven into these previous two issues. 
most games that are made in Korea are not brought to the West via actual development companies. They're usually imported via a publisher. Only the largest companies in the Korean games industry self-publish their titles in other regions. This is mostly due to the infrastructure such as servers, customer service, having actual physical offices in the regions, and ability to navigate the laws and regulations of business in a different region. They'll usually instead opt to contract a publisher with bringing the game to that area, one that has all those things already in place, and a track record of being a middleman for Korean titles to Western audiences. This means that essentially what you have in the West is a lot of companies that are caretakers that have no say in how anything works within the game. The publishers can range from having absolutely zero control over the state of the game that comes to the West, not even minor issues, to having a large amount of control, but in almost all circumstances, publishers do not actively develop the game. To tie it into our previously raised problems with design, publishers in almost every circumstance I'm aware of do not actually change game code and how could they? Just think about this. I mean, you can't have a game developed in the East with one code base, making changes and patches that get, then get transported to our version, and that version having totally different code, game mechanics no longer existing, changes made to fundamental systems. That would mean things would simply not work together. This isn't modular plug-and-play game systems, and so what you'll get is the same game with perhaps some tweaks to easy things such as rates of experience gain, decreasing some currency requirements, and usually they'll charge us a box price for it while keeping one or two of the most egregious cash shop mechanics out of the game. Or perhaps they'll keep it identical and still charge us for the game even though it was free to play in the region. Or another option that we've seen in the past is they'll just tell us it won't be in the game and it won't be pay to win, and then add it in later anyways once the sunk cost fallacy is set in for the community that they've gained a hold of. And nobody can really say, was this the publisher who made this choice or was this the developer? Because we unfortunately don't have access to the contracts that were signed to say who's at fault here. One thing is for certain though, publishers, whether they're Western or not, are not making changes to this game to make them better for us on a fundamental game design level. They just simply don't have the ability to do so. Add on to that that the actual communication between a Western audience and a Korean developer is almost non-existent, and it usually takes the Korean player base to get something changed, which of course isn't always aligned with what we want because it's a different group of people and we don't tend to see or play games in the same ways as I hope I've been able to make clear in the rest of this video. It all just leads to an experience that you either have to love for what it is up front or you just can't enjoy it as none of these things are possible to really change as far as I can tell. There's likely a bunch more points I could bring up in this video as to why it is that Korean MMORPGs suck and they always will do. And again, I say that as someone who has played Korean MMOs since the early 2000s and I actually like them. I'm not using suck as meaning that they're all bad. They just all inherently have these problems baked into them and there's nothing you can do about it because it's from cultural and design standpoints that no one in the West can change. It's actually way more likely in my opinion and based on the trends that I'm seeing in, in video games today that we go in, more in the direction of their games. I think Korean games are different not only in the negative ways that, that I've outlined in this video but in many good ways too. That's all of course going to be preference, do you like the aesthetics, the combat styles, the open world designs. I think most people should be able to agree with the other points in this video as they're not things that benefit us as consumers. Even if you like Korean MMOs, I'd imagine you can agree that these are problems that you would prefer to not have as it would then just make the game better for you as a player or at least I'd hope that that's the case. So this has been my video essay on why Korean MMOs will always suck. They'll still be great if you like Korean MMOs and for me I grew up playing them so I'm part of this and I think as a culture we'll be more accepting of them the more free to play our own games go, the more we become used to these shifts in our own market, our own monetization, and we can already observe this. But there are problems here that will never go away, and for some of you that will mean you'll never be able to enjoy Korean MMOs, and for others they won't ever be as good as they could be, because they're not for us, they're for their own market using their own culturally accepted designs, and then we just get them, usually without many changes, and honestly, they can't really change them for us because it would result in having two different development teams on two different versions of a game. So thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave me a like, drop me a comment below with what you think, 
and hopefully you subscribe to the channel. I do try to make a video every day. I try to make in-depth videos like this, as well as some more reactionary content, reviews, first impressions, things like that. I'd also appreciate if you check out my social medias in the description. I stream on Twitch three or four times a week. I'm active every day in my own Discord server, chatting about games, playing with people. And I have a Patreon if you'd like to support my content further with a few dollars here and there each month. Hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Stay safe out there. We out. Peace. Thank you.